Thank you guys for joining us today. I'm Paul Martin. I'm the CEO of Ten Capital. Today, we have a great presentation from Dr. Harvey Castro on ChatGPT and healthcare, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And with after that, we'll have three presentations from our companies pitching uh, their deal in healthcare. With that, let's go ahead and kick off. Uh, Harvey, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate you coming back and giving us an update on the world of ChatGPT and healthcare. Remember your last presentation? It was a, a hot topic. It was uh, going great and going gangbusters. And now that we've had some experience with it, looking forward to seeing what the good, the bad, and the ugly is all about there. With that, uh, can you go ahead and tell us more about uh, yourself, Harvey, and, and tell us about the, where we are with ChatGPT? Yeah. My name is Dr. Harvey Castro. I'm an emergency room board certified physician for over 20 years. Um, big picture, I've been working on ChatGPT and healthcare. I have the first book out there on ChatGPT and healthcare. So I'm going to start with um, why is ChatGPT so critical for us? Uh, and I'm going to start with this uh, story from today's news. It was uh, a couple of weeks ago, but basically it was this <clears throat> child that had seen over 17 different physicians and over a three-year span, no one could figure out why this child had this chronic pain. Uh, long story short, the mom was just amazing. She she took all the medical data from the physicians, the old MRIs, and she literally started a chat with ChatGPT. And believe it or not, ChatGPT suggested that this could be tethered cord syndrome. And so then the mom went ahead and took uh, the results to the neurosurgeon, and the neurosurgeon was able to reevaluate the MRI and look at all the uh, notes and actually came back and said, you know what, this is actually tethered cord. And so I like starting with that because it leads to my next point. ChatGPT, um, back from Scientific America back in March of this year, late March, it states that ChatGPT's IQ is around 155. That's superior to 99.9% .9 of the test takers out there. And then just to kind of give it some reference, you know, what 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 does that even mean? You know, the average person uh, um, IQ is anywhere between 80 and 110. Somewhere in there is kind of like the populations. Um, doctors tend to be around 110 to give it a little bit more inf. Um, Albert Einstein, they say he's between 155 and 170. Uh, Elon Musk, around 155. Uh, and that, joking aside, I'm going to say the Unabomber was around 180. And so why is it so important to, to talk about these numbers? Well, you know, as we start working with ChatGPT, um, it helps extend our IQ. It helps uh, improve some of the things that we may not know. I'm an ER doctor, I know my space, but having the ability to have something that has a high IQ that I can talk to and reference. And so when you look at ChatGPT, the first question people say is like, hey, how does this even work? And the main thing to know is that basically it's generative AI, it's using this principle called reinforcement uh, human learning and, and all of it feedback, all it is is Think of it this way, when the computer spits out something, it's a doctor in my particular case that's looking at it saying, yes, this is correct or this is wrong. And I say doctor and I stress on it is because this thing was trained for information, but no doctor reviewed it. So when it says, yeah, this looks good, that person that gave it the check mark wasn't a doctor. And, and the reason I stress that point, and you'll see that later in my talk, is that we need to make sure that it's doctors, if we're going to use it in healthcare, reinforcing that learning, making sure that that output is excellent. Now, with ChatGPT, I really think big picture, this is going to help us better communicate. We're all be able to ask better questions. So I'm telling my patients, um, go ahead and um, figure out what questions you want to ask. So that way you get the best experience, not just with me, but with other physicians. And I know doctors hate when I say that, but big picture, it's important because if you know you have diabetes, hypertension, and you only get 13 minutes with your doctor, why not ask the best questions and follow-up questions? And you can do that with ChatGPT. Now, being able to formulate those questions, the next point would be why not bring your laptop or mobile device to the exam room? And so when you are having that conversation with your doctor and your doctor is telling you about X, Y disease, why not have ChatGPT kind of help you understand that and that together with your doctor and you and ChatGPT, you're able to look at it because we know that there's some issues with ChatGPT. We know that there's hallucination. So why not have this AI help us formulate the questions? And then you have the expert sitting right next to you to say, yeah, this is correct or incorrect. And they're basically vetting the information. And so after the uh, patient scene, the other part of this talk, I always say, why not have ChatGPT or uh, let's just not even promote ChatGPT, any other GPT. I know that BARD's coming out, uh, Gemini, Google is gonna have a huge product coming up here soon. 
why not have those functionalities integrated into your discharge instructions? So that way you're able to give a better discharge. I used to work in a uh, hospital that was really close to the airport and we would get people literally from all over the world. And ironically, anybody that got sick in Dallas, Fort Worth area airport, they would bring them to our hospital. So we would be able to see patients that maybe they were in front of uh, the latest strain of X disease. So my point is this, by using ChatGPT, not only can I do a better discharge instruction in that I can create better uh, talking to them in their native language, I can convert the examples. I'm in the United States, I use US examples, but honestly, some of the examples that I may use may not apply to someone in the other side of the world. So why not use ChatGPT to help make those uh, okay, good yeah, points? Okay. All right, so then some of the bad, obviously, number one, um, everybody knows that being able to put information that's personal into ChatGPT, you're going to violate HIPAA rules. And if you're out in Europe, the GDPR. So for privacy reasons, we can't be doing that. If we do use ChatGPT, we need to make sure that we're taking out what we call here in the United States, the 18 identifiers. Okay, now it's going, sorry. It just went on. It's got its own mind. <laughs> Let me go back. And so big picture, uh, we need to make sure that we're presenting this correctly. We're making sure that when we do put pre present things to ChatGPT, we're taking the 18 identifiers. Um, I'm going back to the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find that one slide, but. So then the other part here is better communication. Um, I'm gonna move, I know we've lost a couple of minutes. So I wanna make them back. So basically better communication. Um, I found this fascinating. A hospital in England was able to use ChatGPT, take its um, um, discharge instructions that they had for a child and they said, you know what, ChatGPT changed this as if you're talking to a four-year-old. So it took adult language for discharge instructions, put it as if you were talking with four-year-old words. And then they took mid-journey, combined it together, the concepts, and they handed a, the child and family a discharge instructions. And I thought that was cool because now it's a basically a little cartoon um, that the child can play with and um, coloring book and now understand their disease process. And I see more and more applications in the future coming out that way. Now, the other part for ChatGPT, medical knowledge now is doubling every 30 days. So what does that mean? You know, back in the 1950s, every 50 years, my medical knowledge would double. And so if my medical knowledge is having to double every 30 days, there's so much information that I need to come up with. That's why we have specialist. But then again, if all that information is doubling, it's getting really difficult to be able to keep up. So I think with the power of something like GPT can give me the latest and greatest information and can literally surf all the medical journals and then give me a weekly update of all the medical information. Now there's a data scientist. Uh, I found this website. It's really cool. It's data science AI tutor. And, and I think this is coming from the medical school side, but basically what they did is they uploaded all their uh, data science information, and they put a bot to go through. And then this bot literally um, will help you go through the different lectures and different parts of data science. And I thought, you know what, this principle would work great. Going back to my bad uh, portion slides is, you know, obviously we know that it hallucinates. The other bad is that we know that this information may not be up to date. September 21 is the cutoff, but there's ways of fixing that. And then I'll just briefly say that using plugins and uh, being co-pilot, you're able to use the internet so that it can do a little bit of both, that we're not going just by the data set limited to September 2021. Um, obviously, it has a huge carbon footprint. Um, the ethics involved, I'm personally worried that, you know, if this information is helping us live longer, get better health care, what if all of a sudden uh, this technology gets to the point where it gets so expensive and now people can't get to it? Believe it or not, there are some people around the world that don't have access to the internet. So if they don't have access to the internet, they don't have access to this. So that that's actually uh, an issue. Recently, I was in the news talking about uh, AI could hit the black market. I was talking to Fox News about, you know, there is a way of creating your own large language model that's off the grid that could help criminals on how to kill people and how to cover their crimes. And so me personally, I'm, I'm actually worried about, you know, what if... Um, this is not done correctly. And what if some people are starting to do this? I'm personally not worried about the big players out there because they're being regulated. They're going to be regulated by the government. Um, companies are are watching, but I'm more worried about the black market. So just wanted to mention that. The other portion to this is references. You know, people are like, well, I use ChatGPT. I get no references. Well, my answer back is if you use perplexity AI, it's using the power of ChatGPT4. And when 
you ask a question, it actually will give you the references and as, as far as giving you hyperlinks to show you the references. So that's pretty cool. Now, Bing Chat tries to do the same and it's on there. So I just wanted to show you that that does. With that said, I think it still can, in theory, hallucinate, um, but it does a really good job with those hyperlinks. So if it does, it's taking you exactly where it got the information. I was playing with Google and I, I'm a part of a beta and I'm sure some people already have this, but you can now use that same function in Google. So Google now has that. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about the bad is this, um, as a doctor, I can say I have this clinical gestalt. I've been doing this for a long time. I know what I see and I'm worried that the younger docs are gonna start overusing, uh, my example is you overusing CAT scans depending on technology and they're gonna start losing that art of medicine. And I'm very worried that if AI does such a good job that they're gonna start um, just focusing too much on AI to the point where if it's hallucinating or has an issue, they're gonna be stuck. So that's my personal worry on that. Now, the other part I, I joke is like the unknown. Well, if you don't know the unknown, how can you talk about it? Well, I, I, I'm worried about things that may happen through ChatGPT that we haven't thought through. Um, I personally think that um, there'll be uh, continents like Africa that will actually start seeing faster implementation of chat GPT equivalent in their healthcare system faster than the United States being risk versus benefits. You know, if there's parts of the world that do not have access to the internet, well, I could see like a company like Elon Musk satellites being able to give those countries internet and then the government setting up these mobile uh, places where they have computers and putting them out in the different villages and that's their healthcare. And then they have a PA verifying all this. And, and I know that sounds kind of crazy, but I do see that happening. Some of the fun things, and I got to recently play with this, ChatGPT uh, now allows you to take a picture of something and upload it to the web. And it's really cool to their chat, to their platform. Um, so just keeping it simple, if you have a skin rash or something, you could take a picture, have ChatGPT analyze it. It does all the legal disclaimers saying, hey, I'm not a doctor, this can't be done and whatnot. Um, but it does actually a pretty good job on the, the derm side. Uh, other examples, I put an EKG and um, it actually found the correct diagnosis looking at the EKG. Now, again, for the people that are non-clinical, I'm not telling you to replace your doctor with ChatGPT at all. I just want to show you proof of concept. And as an ER doctor, one of the things that I see often is people that are overdose. And when they overdose, unfortunately, they're unconscious. I don't know what they overdosed on. Sometimes the paramedics find some pills and they bring the fragment pills to me and say, hey, doc, this is what we found by the bed. And so now I, I did an experiment. I took pictures of those pills just to see what came out. And it actually did a not too bad job. <laughs> out of four different pills, two of them I couldn't identify. One of them it identified perfectly. The other one it missed it identified. And I know that sounds horrible, but I'm saying this is just a beta. Could you imagine when this actually gets trained with the right data, it's going to get it right and we'll be able to do more applications. I mentioned earlier Google Gemini. Keep an eye out. Um, Google's putting out a product called Gemini. Right now, if you play with Bard, it doesn't give you the best results. But once they change the back engine to this thing called Gemini, you're going to start seeing amazing results. I'm calling 2024 as the year of multimodality, meaning I could take a picture, upload it. I could uh, take a video, upload it, and it'll interpret it. But then I could do vice versa. I can start typing, hey, I need a video on X or eh, or hey, using Dolly, I need a picture of Y. And it'll create it. It'll go both ways. And I really think that's the future. Now, Microsoft has recently added uh, GPT uh, capability in their operating systems. And I believe for next year is when their next operating system will come out. And when that comes out, it's going to be even better. But big picture... If you need a PowerPoint, you can say, hey, I need a PowerPoint for a presentation. Uh, the idea would be that PowerPoint would understand what you're saying and it would actually create your slides and even the pictures. And so those kind of capability is gonna be huge. Say you're listening to this conversation today and six months I said something that you're like, oh man, Dr. Castro said X, Y. Well, in theory, you could index it from this conversation and it would be able to find our, our conversation and what I said and, and show you the slide. And that'll be the power that's gonna be right on your desktop. Some general uses for doctors out there, you know, everybody's heard of this pre-authorization letter where ChatGPT can write it, or I'm going through your files and it's like, you know, you have like 10 different MRIs, CAT scans and a thick file. Well, now summarization, I can take that and create summaries using ChatGPT where I don't have to go through the entire record. I can ask for what I need and it'll go through it. 
Epic is an electronic medical record here in the United States, and they're in bed with Microsoft and OpenAI, and they're already releasing products like that. I'm going to throw a curveball here and say, you know what, as doctors, we don't do a really good job with empathy or teaching empathy. Why not use ChatGPT to help us uh, with our empathy, with the words that we should use, how we sit, how we talk, what we say. And I do see that as a strength coming in the near future. Now, I've already mentioned the medical records, talked about patient communication, disease, uh, diagnosis, triage. You know, I used to work at Parkland and they had this little kiosk that would help you go through your um, symptoms and it would tell you if you need to go to the emergency room, urgent care, it's all connected there. I thought, man, this is going to be a great tool. Now, obviously, this has some wrinkles. If you do that today, if you don't do it correctly, it, it would possibly need FDA approval or more than likely it will. But these are just examples of what can happen. I know for sure drug discovery has now been a, some AI companies that are doing drug discoveries are claiming that their processes uh, costs have gone down by 90 percent. And so I'm really stoked about seeing how these different tools are out and about and doing this. I know AI in general is already being used in radiology, uh, detecting breast cancer, detecting uh, different lesions. You know, that's been out there, you know, for better or worse, it's catching some of these and some of them are not. So again, this, this, these tools for some, for some uses are perfect for some are still, you know, to be determined, but, but I'm excited to see how fast we're moving forward. You know, I mentioned already the, the, the child at the beginning of the conversation. Here's another one where um, AI helped actually this identify this rare disease. And and the skinny is this, it it found a disease and then the parents and the, this company were able to realize that it, it needed a, a certain amount of um, change in, in the environment. And it told it what to do so that these special levels that would help cure this disease would increase. And, and when I read this, I was impressed. And this is back from 2019. Now, the other thing people are always talking about, like, well, there's this Dr. Google. Now now we have Dr. ChatGPT. And, and to be honest, that's my biggest worry. I'm, I'm more worried about people using ChatGPT and thinking it's a doctor and not realizing that it's hallucinating, that's making a mistake. Uh, ChatGPT, if you haven't played with it, it does such a freaking good job that it could convince us that that it's it's correct when in reality it's wrong. And so me personally, I, I like using this for explaining different difficult concepts. And I see different companies doing that. You know, um, ideally, we, we must have our patients realize that a lot of this, if we are using AI or technology, how we're doing it. And I feel like some patients are giving permission, but they're not really realizing what they're giving permission to. Medical research world, this is huge. I've seen so many different applications where AI is helping create the grant proposal. It's looking at this literature, it's finding the articles, it's reviewing the articles, it's dissecting these. You know, uh, I, I read an article yesterday that talked about how medical research used to go uh, for some of these grants could take three months and they're able to knock it out in three days and sometimes in three hours, depending on what the grant is, which again, it's using large language model. I mentioned already using large language model for patient education and, and medical records. And obviously that's another one. We talked about drug development, but we haven't talked about personalized medicine. The, the idea is this, ChatGPT and these large language models can take a lot of information. So imagine in a world that you could take your human genome and know it's specific for you and now start creating uh, drugs that are specific for your DNA. That's what this large language model is going to be able to do. So in theory, if you need dose of X, let's, I'm going to make a drug up. Say you need you use drug X and you need 100 milligrams because we're converting it and it's personalized medicine, there could be a possibility where instead of needing 100 milligrams, it's just 10 milligrams because it's specific to you. We should have less side effects and, and ideally better outcome for you. Um, we talked about the faster access to this information and safer clinical trials. You know, from a, considering implementing this in healthcare, obviously the number one thing everybody talks about is data, privacy, and security. We must make sure that we're uh, conforming to our regulatory compliance for HIPAA and GDPR. And obviously, I'm really big on the human insight uh, oversight. We we can't let this thing just go willy nilly. We need to have, make sure that the that we're looking at this to make sure that this isn't making up things. So, as we move forward, you know, what will be the future for ChatGPT? To me. Uh, I think we're going to have better discharge instructions. I'm going to give highlight some clinics here, like Mayo Clinic is using MedPalm 2 to give better um, instructions to their patients using AI. Uh, the other one that I thought was really cool is this thing called New York Tron. Basically, think of all this data that's already at the hospital level, and then they created their own large language model to help uh, 
predict. Should this patient go home? Should this patient stay? And so I think with the future of healthcare, um, we'll start seeing more and more APIs and, and uh, other companies, startups doing more and more things for healthcare. You know, I want to highlight quickly for uh, plugins, everybody's used Instacart. Well, what if your doctor, what if you were a diabetic and what if your doctor used ChatGPT with a plugin for Instacart? And I'll walk you through it. Here's the skinny. Patient comes in, high sugar, not eating well. Obviously, it's all diet related. The patient now turns around and says, you know what? We're going, uh, the doctor's going to, knows you hate eggs, knows you you don't like seafood, uses ChatGPT to create a whole menu with every meal for the week with all the ingredients. And guess what? Using this plugin can now put it on your cart. And by the time you're home, the groceries are waiting for you. What a way of really helping your patients. Um, this one was one that I did. I created a plugin called Decision Matrix. The skinny is this. I created uh, different prompts. You put in a question like for this one was medical, uh, but you could do it for businesses and marketing. But basically I said, hey, there's a patient that's a chronic alcoholic. They need a liver. You know, should we give this patient a liver transplant or not? Because they're an alcoholic. And it literally, mm -hmm. this thing goes through. Um, and then I asked the question, it goes through and then it gives this Q&A. It's taking a little bit here to load, but I won't labor on it. But the skinny is this technology is going to be huge. <laughs> Um, like, for example, on the decision matrix one, if you're trying to market X, Y, and Z, you can put in the question, use the power of chat GPT, and then it goes through all the different ways of marketing product X, Y, and Z. It, it, I, I'm, I'm just amazed of how fast this technology is moving. Now, for healthcare specific, we need something like BioGPT. We need something like Gatortron. Basically, what I'm getting at is we need large language model that's trained on science data that we use, our medical journals, our medical books, uh, not just random knowledge that they found on the internet to make the product. I know that Glass Health is one of these products that doctors can go on and ask a clinical vignette, and it will tell you a differential diagnosis and treatment. Personally, I think when I look at the product, it's getting very close where it's going to need FDA approval. Uh, in the news, if you haven't seen, Hippocratic AI is another AI at large language model that's going to be working with patients and helping them um, as far as like doctor burnout and nurses and whatnot. They have this press release that says that that's their claim. My thing is, you know what? When is the large language model for your specialty if you're an ER doctor is going to come out? Or I really think the future is going to be your LLM where it's going to be on your phone. Um, going back to that slide, when you think about it, uh, I don't know many people realize this, but Apple, the new 15 product that just came out, the latest product, that iPhone now has uh, a small large language model, has about 34 million parameters, but what it could do is gonna be doing better autocomplete. The only reason I mention it is if they just put it on now, imagine when they start adding more data to this large language model, as far as the memory capacity, you can start doing things that you don't need the internet. And I think that is gonna be the future. Now, as an aside, this graph GPT is a big deal. You know, a lot of doctors are like, how did ChatGPT come up with that answer? Well, if you use something like GraphGPT, it puts all the symptoms, put it together, and it kind of walks you through the process. And that's another one that will be coming soon. I just mentioned the small large language model for the iPhone, but those kind of things are, are going to become more and more vogue. You know, I joke and say, you know what, the AI wars are upon us. We have Microsoft fighting for our time. We have Google fighting for our time. And I think at the end of it, you know, there's going to be other markets out there that are going to start growing. Keep an eye on Elon Musk. He's got, I think he's got the best storm coming for himself. He's got literally all the data he needs with uh, Tesla. And then he's got Twitter or X. He's got, these things take a lot of energy. So he's got the solar system. He's got these solar uh, cities where they literally can power. He has free energy. And then he's got the best team. He just created a team of formal uh, AI uh, futurists and they put them all together to create his own GPT. So I wouldn't be surprised in about six to 12 months that we start seeing um, him as a leader in this space. Um, just as an aside, there was this thing called, uh, it's called advanced data analysis. It's part of ChatGPT4. You have to have a paid subscription. I took my LinkedIn picture and I uploaded it and I said, hey, give me a, a video. And it actually made a video. Other things that I could do is um, I took some data from the government um, that was public facing as far as uh, weight loss and, and, and risk factors. And I uploaded it to this ADA with that's inside of ChatGPT. And I was able to have it create different uh, diagrams, pictures, tell me what the hot zones are. 
What are the risk factors? I literally was able to have a nice conversation with the data. What the future holds, I already mentioned this thing about multimodality, but the skinny is, um, there's a picture of VR. I, I really think we'll be able to type and we'll start seeing videos or we have the video and then it'll make the text. I think in the future, I see robots. Uh, ChatGPT has invested into another company that they're releasing robots this year. And I'm thinking, well, you have the robot, you have ChatGPT 4 or 5, and the eyes can now do all of these functions, and you put it inside the robot. Now that robot could be part of the hospital and can help you bring meds, can help you lift patients, can be an assistant for me. Say I'm seeing a patient, and the eyes of the pa of the robot can see the patient's uh, hemoglobin and what's A1C, which is the average sugar, which just with the camera, with the eyes of the robot, or the blood pressure of the patient. There's so many things that that assistant can tell me that I can do better healthcare for my patients. Um, I was asked to be on an interview for AI pets and, and that will be coming in the near future where these pets will be AI operated. I think uh, AI, VR and AR is gonna be big. Uh, Meta just recently announced that they're going to have their Google glasses. Uh, I'm not Google glasses, their Meta glasses. And I really see this uh, functionality being bigger in healthcare. Um, as an aside, I, I just was playing with uh, ChatGPT and I basically cloned my voice. And what I did is I take my voice, I find an article that's interesting on AI healthcare. I plug it into ChatGPT, it makes a fake conversation. Then I take that conversation and I plug it into my clone voice and now I have a podcast. Um, so it's kind of interesting with the stuff that people can do. And this is me with very little uh, technology training, being able to do this. Um, the future, I think, I, I, this was another, I was on Fox News talking about how uh, ChatGPT can help uh, solve some crimes. And I was talking to the different uh, news department, I mean, uh, police departments to tell them how it could be used to help them find some of these cases. It's quite interesting. But big picture, um, I'm going to just fly through these last slides and just say um, the, the future is here. You know, I, I, I really want us as healthcare professionals to really learn how to use this. Um, recently, the new, in the news, the SEC came out, the president of, or the head of the FCC said, that in the next 10 years, he sees AI crashing the market because it's going to make so many changes. So I think it's, it's important for us to learn. And I created this course just to learn about this uh, ChatGPT. And I have these cheat sheets that are free just to help people to use ChatGPT in healthcare. And so big picture, if you need anything, just feel free to holler at me. That's my, uh, I'm on all social media. It's on Harvey Castro MD and I'm on all the major platforms and those are my QR codes. So thanks for having me and I'll be here to answer any questions. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, if you have questions in the audience, please put it in the chat box. My first question is, we have a lot of startups that are in the vertical SaaS space. Instead of trying to do something very broad, they do something very narrow. And by narrowing it, they can go very deep, make it highly accurate, and then reduce the cost of building it. Do you foresee that the way healthcare is going to break down lots of verticals? Or do you think it's going to be remain integrated in like bio GPT where everything is done in one module? Talked about having your own version, but it seemed like there's a middle ground there. What are your thoughts? I personally think it's for healthcare, depending what part of healthcare, for example, like if you're just doing the discharge instruction, then you can get away with using a lot of these APIs and doing a SaaS model. If you're working on something that is specific for the ER and a specific uh, functionality that may violate HIPAA, then I feel like you have to have your own GPT equivalent and make the model and then have that model inside the hospital walls. So that way you don't have to worry about that information leaking. I know I've spoken with different CEOs around the world on um, creating their own large language model for their hospital system. And one of the complaints I hear often is they don't want to pay for a subscription model. They don't want their own SaaS model. They, they want you to come into their hospital system and build their own uh, AI for them. So that'll be interesting to see what happens. Great. My next question is, we talked a lot about the healthcare aspect of it, but then there's the healthcare operations aspect, You know, the patient management, the regulatory, the reimbursement, and so forth. Uh, where do you think it's going to hit first, on the patient side or more on the back office side as far as health AI improving healthcare? Yeah, I think it's going to happen more on the back side, it, just because unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of this thing requires resources and money. And because of that, if an uh, administrator can see that AI could get the information sent quicker to the billing and get that bill out quicker and, and get those improved uh, cash flow quicker to them, they're going to spend money. So I see a lot of uh, movement in that space. 
you talk about HIPAA, HIPAA requirements and so forth and the challenge of personal information being inside an AI system. What are their proposed solutions around that? How do you filter out HIPAA, you know, specific data from these systems going forward, but they still need the data for doing analysis and so forth? Yeah, that's interesting. I see a couple of things. I see um, one simple way would be scrubbing the data where, you know, instead of Miss Jones, it's some other person. And so ChatGPT uh, never sees those names. Those names stay in. The other thing, depending on what you're doing and how you're doing, I see a lot of movement in synthetic data. And so they're changing it and giving the data that's similar to it, but not exact data. And that synthetic data is being sent to ChatGPT and then it's coming back and being converted back to that person. So it's quite interesting how that all is moving forward. And I think that's going to be the way that it's done. And then the last would be um, going into the hospital system and creating their own large language model and they're keeping it inside their own servers. We saw in the uh, the writing world or the Hollywood world that people are trying to protect their their content and they're suing to not have their data be put in there. Do you see something similar happening in healthcare? Doctors trying to capture their data and monetize it for themselves, or is it more collegial and everyone wants their data into one system so all can benefit and everybody's happy with that? Yeah, unfortunately, that's I don't see I see the same issue in healthcare. Um, every hospital system is not going to want to. Uh, share their data with a different hospital system. I think what's going to happen is something called federated learning. So say you're part of hospital system A, then they will have their own data. And because every person in that hospital is different, meaning different zip codes are different. So if you have hospital system A that's in New York, but then they have another hospital that's in, in Philadelphia, the data sets are different. Well, what's going to happen is uh, the information that's being shared is since it's the same system will be shared, but then the hospital systems in both cities will help train each other. But then when they want to ask a question that's specific to their city, the AI will answer that question for their city. Great. And what do you think is the next generation going to look like as far as healthcare goes for actually doing these systems? Are they going to be in our pocket? And how soon will they be on our iPhone where we can use them? Or is it still going to be in the cloud and we have to be attached to a network? When, when will that switch occur? Yeah, the, unfortunately, these these data sets are really big. And so it's really difficult to put it all on your phone. So you would be able to have like a small portion of it. With that said, now, ironically, what they're doing is these big models are being trained to make them smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, Meta owners of Facebook are looking at creating a model that's already out that's called Llama. Next year, they're going to be producing a product that, again, this is free for everybody to use. And they are claiming that it'll be smaller than ChatGPT and four, and it'll be as good as ChatGPT four. So I'm thinking, wow, if they were able to reduce the size of the model and it's going to be just as good, then eventually that will get on our phones. As far as time, that's a hard one because to me, unless somebody invents some mega size uh, memory to be small enough to be on your phone, and then reducing these models, I personally think it would take like ten years from now to get to that point. We talked about people creating their own LLM. At uh, how hard or how easy is that to do today? Are the tools available and how would I do that? Yeah, actually, it's not hard at all. In fact, I'm doing this for hospital systems. Um, basically, you're able to create your own. Um, depending on what your needs are, uh, you can use an open model like um, Llama that I just explained. Um, so yeah, Llama is the one that I would use. And then you can train it with your own data. Um, for those people that are wanting to use AI, but they're really worried that, hey, this information can't go to ChatGPT or any big distributor, I tell them, get yourself a computer that's brand new uh, and I can tell you how to do it. And then basically download Llama and make sure that that computer has no internet access. And now you can have your own conversation, your own LLM, and there's no way anyone can get it unless they steal your computer. I've read many of the license agreements around some of these LLM systems, and it basically says if you put your data into it, they own your data. Is that true of Llama? And is there a way to protect your data in the using these systems? Yeah, good question. So that's perfect. So the answer is uh, no. You would download the entire model. You would put it on your computer, and then uh, you would be able to use it, and there's no way that Llama would get it unless you upload it to their servers. But th in this case, you're using an open source that's only on your computer that has no internet access that you're putting its information. So no, it'd be 100%. Well, I hate saying 100%. It'd be pretty safe. <laughs> We, we talk about, you know, biases and some of these other things in the, the bad part of the presentation. And my question is, is are there active uh, techniques people are putting into place or is this something we're just going to have to live with it some at some level? 
that's a tough one. I think I think what we need is we need to have this information for every region. For example, uh, people in Africa are using ChatGPT and the data that's been trained and, and especially healthcare, it's, it's the population here in the United States. And if they try to use it, they're going to have biases. And so it's not going to work for them. So my point is, let's create the same ChatGPT, but let's create one just for Africa or just for that country or just for that zip code. That way we eliminate a lot of these biases. Now, there's biases in the data set because the people that have money have created these research projects. Well, unfortunately, some of the underserved communities are not rep well represented in a lot of these researches. So then my answer there is we need to have someone like Elon Musk to fund some of these projects so that we able to equally represent some of these uh, smaller populations. Great. This is my last question. If anybody in the audience has a question, please put it in now, and then we'll move on to our next presentation. My last question is, is, is do you think Elon Musk actually took over Twitter just to get the data set for AI, or do you think there are other things there? I honestly think he was playing chess, and I really think he bought it knowing that that's what he needed. He has the most data for Tesla cars, and now with this, it's giving him real-time information. So it's going to be a beast, uh, you know, I think, 12 months for him as far as him being able to use that information. Cool. Interesting. It is a game of chess for sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Castro, for that great presentation. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and bring up our first presenter, uh, Cecily Vieni of High Pretension. Cecily, if you could go ahead and turn your video on and microphone. Love to see your presentation. And uh, Dr. Castro, looking forward to your feedback here as well. Go ahead, Cecily. Uh, good evening. Uh, good uh, good morning. Sorry, I'm in France and it's 9 p.m. <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, probably. So my name is Cecile Vieni. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Eye Prevention. I co-founded this company with uh, spine surgeons in order to develop the strut plastic technology. And the purpose of this technology is to reinforce the bone weakened by osteoporosis or cancer. And today we have a first product available on the US market to treat vertebral fracture and prevent vertebral fractures. So the problem we want to solve is that there are a lot of vertebral fracture in the US, about 750,000, and about 30% of this fracture lead to a surgical treatment. And besides that, uh, after the treatment, about 25 percent of the patient will have an adjacent fracture within the six months. That means uh, if you look at the picture on the on the right, uh, you have the fracture on, at one level that is treated and you will have other fracture at the upper or lower level. The, so this is a big problem because it affects the quality of life of the patient and they have to come back for new surgery, new uh, follow up and etc. Uh, osteoporotic fracture is really the, our main market because uh, among the vertebral fractures, there are about 70% that are due to osteoporosis, but there is also about 20% of the fracture, vertebral fractures that are due to cancer, as you can see on the picture at the top. Uh, so we have developed the Vistred transpedicular implant that is patented and FDA cleared since 2020. And the purpose of this device is really to treat the fracture and prevent the adjacent fracture. The concept is that we use an implant made of polymer, and the polymer is very close to the normal bone. And doing that, we reinforce the vertebrae in order to treat and prevent the fracture. And our device is combined with bone cement, a regular bone cement, in order to fix the fracture. And what is different from any other concept is that with our implant, we create a full reinforcement of the vertebrae instead of treating the fracture in the vertebral body only, meaning the anterior part of the vertebrae. Uh, we have uh, competitors, but uh, none of these solutions on the market are able to address the problem of adjacent fracture. So the first product on the market was vertebroplasty, where uh, we are putting cement alone. It was a long time ago. Later on, in about 2007, uh, there was a uh, kyphoplasty technique with a balloon in order to create a cavity to uh, inject the bone cement. And uh, more recently, in 2018, 
the uh, kyphoplasty by implant was introduced. The product you see is a spanjac that was developed in France. I developed this product before. And this product was more for uh, traumatic fracture, not really for osteoporotic fracture and cancer and cancer fracture. So this product does not uh, allow to reduce the adjacent fracture. But with this threat, we really are able to reduce the adjacent fracture. We also have a very easy technique to implant our device, and we have a very affordable cost for the product, uh, mainly because the reimbursement uh, exists for the for the product. So the company was established in France, and we still we are still doing uh, research and development. <clears throat> sorry, quality regulatory and production in France. But since two thousand twenty one. We have a subsidiary in the US where we, uh, <coughs> excuse me, where we manage the marketing, the sales, and the post-market studies. So in the, the team consists in, of course, myself, we have a CFO, a plant manager in France, and in the US, we have a team of four business managers in the different area in order to really develop the sales of this product. We also have a medical advisory board with a doctor from uh, Mount Sinai uh, in New York and Dr. Khan, a key opinion leader at John Hopkins in Baltimore. And uh, finally, we have a strategic committee where we have two representatives that are uh, co-founders and one representative is uh, uh, one of our co, one of our lead investors, sorry, our lead investor is Yellowstone. It's a family office from Switzerland. Our business model is, as I said, we manufacture the product uh, in France or in Europe, managed from France. Then we ship the product to our warehouse in the US. And finally, we sell our product to our end users and our end user, our hospital, surgical center, or OBL. And we try to balance the targets between hospital and surgical center OBL because in the hospital, we have a very high reimbursement and we have high pricing, but the process approval is a bit long. And in the surgical center, we have a quick access because the doctor can decide immediately if they want to use the product, but the pricing is lower because the reimbursement is lower. So we do direct sales to this, uh, the facilities and we have, as I said, our four business development manager, but we also work with the help of sales agents, independent sales agents that are paid with commission only. We have a roadmap of products. So as I said, we have the 510K for Vistrut in 2020. As a year after, we had the reimbursement coding uh, and we launched the product in 2022. This year, we are working on our uh, hip product. This is a prophylactic device to reinforce the hip. We already have a clinical experience of more than 100 patients for this uh, device. It, the, the patients were treated in Europe. And today, we are preparing our application for a breakthrough designation. We plan to launch new sizes and new indication for this next year. And the year after, we will continue to enhance the product. And the year after, we will uh, launch the wise thread product. And all this is protected by our patents. We really think that uh, we will be successful with our technology for different reasons. The first one is that uh, we have a very unique clinical approach that really makes sense for the physicians. So our technical approach is really the use of our polymer implants, uh, full reinforcement of the vertebrae and really addressing the problem of adjacent fracture. The second is that we have a very unique uh, storytelling because as I said before, I developed the Spanjax that has been acquired by Stryker. So developed in a French company, but acquired by Stryker in 2018. So it gives a lot of credibility to the company to our prevention. And finally, we are working on the biggest market by addressing the problem of uh, vertebral fracture in osteoporosis and cancer. So this is really the big, big market for, for vertebral fracture. In terms of achievement, we have scientific publication, patent, FDA, and we have really started to develop at our network of clients. We have uh, several VAC approval in progress in order to enter in more hospitals. We have distribution agreement. We really are developing our, our network to be successful commercially and technically, clinically. Uh, we are on, a, as I 
uh, already mentioned on a very big market, very dynamic market because of the aging of the population. So in the US, we estimate that today it's about a half billion market to treat percutaneous vertebral augmentation. So this is really the market with our technology or our competitors. Um, it's a very, very big market, and this market is going to double uh, in 2030. So very dynamic market. Uh, in terms of cash flow, so we had started to generate revenue uh, the, the year we launched the product. Uh, we are really progressing this year and uh, in terms of sales. And uh, we plan to be about uh, to, to sell about 20 million to have 20 million in revenue in 2027. Uh, and today we have a, a, a cash burn of about $125,000. So today we, uh, sorry, uh, to get to this point, we had uh, an investment between 2010 and 2020, about 9.6 million, invested mainly from business angels. Uh, so the founders, the friends of the founder and business angels. And we have one lead investor, as I said, Yellowstone, a family office. And today we are seeking 10 more millions for our next step uh, development. So. Uh, for our uh, needs between 2023 and 2025. Uh, we will have three tranches for the investment. So the first one will be uh, for $2 million. Uh, with this money, we plan to develop and continue to develop uh, our US team and sales to reach our sales figure. We will continue to promote our product and train our users because we have to Right now, users to have uh, successful uh, clinical outcomes. We will enhance the product with new sizes and new education. And we are currently completing a US national post market registry. Uh, and we plan to have uh, 500 patients in this registry. So this will be the first tranche. The second tranche for next year uh, will be to continue to enhance the Vistrad product and develop the Ystrad product for the hip. And finally, a last tranche in order to have an international development of the company. As exit, we plan for an acquisition within three to four years for about $200 million. And uh, it's based on our, comp on our comparator. So uh, for example, Stryker acquires a spine jack developed in France by Vexim for 185 million. It was 10 times the sales in Europe, and it was also the times they get the 510K. In our case, we have the 510K and we are developing ourselves in, uh, in the US. There is also another great example. It's uh, Boston, Boston Scientific uh, that acquire Vertiflex, a spine product for almost half billion just when they get the 510K. So uh, acquisition works well in our environment of uh, orthopedic spine products. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that presentation. Uh, Dr. Castro, what's your first question? Um, I, I'm glad to see that it's uh, already in the 10K. So what is the next process? Uh, I mean, are, is this going, what, what's your next stage after your 510K? So we are selling the product. So the objective is really to, to uh, to uh, implant, uh, treat patient, have a good clinical outcome, continue to uh, make clinical publications. And thanks to this experience in the field, we uh, enhance our products. So for example, we had last year uh, or this year, beginning of the year, a request from our user to have a new sizes, a smaller size. So that's what we have developed and we are working on a special 510K uh, in order to have more sizes. Uh, we also are working on more indication, uh, larger indication, because we know that there's a big potential for our product. And uh, also develop more products thanks to this uh, strut practice plastic technology. And this technology is a combination of pig polymer plus bone cement in order to really reinforce the bone weakened by osteoporosis or cancer. Sounds so good. We good could have application. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, my question is, I often I understand that a fracture often leads to more fractures. How effective is your tool in preventing follow on fractures? So today, based on our clinical experience, we have only 3% of adjacent fracture, which is really low compared to the other techniques 
it's more 25 percent with the uh, kyphoplasty or whatever plasty. Uh, the publication say it's 10 percent with spanjak, but according to the doctor, it's much more than that. And it's really linked to our technology, to our uh, particular anchorage. We have done finite element analysis to show how our implant behave in the vertebrae and is able to absorb the stress received on the vertebrae. And that's why our concept is very different and very promising for the patients. What is the cost of a procedure in this space? If I went to the hospital to have one of these, what would it cost uh, me or and how much is it re reimbursed by the, uh, the government? Yeah, so it does not cost anything to the patient. Uh, really does not cost anything. Uh, the the hospital purchases the device, and the hospital gets the reimbursement from Medicare uh, each time they they do a cases. So it's one hundred percent reimbursed for the hospital, and it's free for the patient. Great, thanks. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Thanks so much for your presentation, and you. we'll look forward to the next steps here. With that, let's go ahead and move to our next presenter, Intac. Uh, Buddy, if you can launch your slides, love to kick off there. Yeah. So I'm Buddy Lyons. I'm the CEO of uh, Intac Medical. We're a commercial digital health company that's developing acoustic analytic and AI devices to predict serious adverse events. Uh, we launched our first product in the first quarter, Preva CA, with 20 sales reps in the fields into a, a billion and a half dollar market. And we received an FDA label expansion in May, which uh, increases our U.S. market by fivefold to about a billion and a half dollars. Our current financing is a 1.5 convertible note with a 20% discount into a price round at an $8 million cap. Um, we just received, a, announced last Thursday, we received a major, uh, the second major investment from Clinical Technology Inc., which is our contract sales manu uh, organization, our major sales force for the product, which uh, closed, effectively closed out that note, but we've extended that note up to $1.75 million with the closing in October of thir October 31st. We've got 1.675 committed, so we've got about $75,000 left on that note uh, before it closes out. Uh, the first one, what Prevacy addresses is the critical need for a solution in post-operative illness and about $2.5 million, million uh, U.S. major abdominal surgeries. Uh, Post-operative ileus is, is most common complication in major abdominal surgery, up to 30% of cases. It's acute paralysis of the GI tract that begins two to 10 days post-op. It causes other uh, adverse events downstream, and it's the leading cause of readmission at about 20% and prolonged unnecessary length of stay at about three to five days. The problem right now is that patients at risk for post-operative ileus cannot be identified, and so the current protocols for doing this are very reactive and they lack precision because we can't identify those patients. A couple of different ways that surgery is done is doing uh, delayed oral refeeding. Uh, the problem with the, the advantage of that is you have almost no readmissions, but uh, you're losing about $11,000 per case uh, when doing this type of surgery because you've got a median length of stay of eight days. Uh, what was developed later was um, early oral refeeding and early discharge, and you have a lower length of stay of about five and a half days. You're still losing about $4,000 per case in a fixed payment system, uh, readmission rate of 20% or more, and you're increasing risk of um, adverse events happening after discharge. So neither one of these uh, post-operative care pathways is obviously optimal. Uh, what Prevacy A is, is it is precision medicine. So we, it proactively identifies at-risk patients with gastrointestinal impairment due to an ileus, and it enables personalized post-op refeeding and discharge strategies to optimize length of stay and uh, reduce readmissions. It's very simple. You place it on the patient with an hour of surgery, and it's quantifying um, the detections of an acoustic biomarker called MH4. Um, this is sort of the discovery in the device, which is highly correlated to development of a post-operative ileus. And it predicts at post-op hour 12, the risk of the patient developing an ileus, ileus two to 10 days after surgery, um, which has a number of benefits. If you know that, you can personalize post-op care. Low risk, you know, uh, when the device uh, identifies a low risk patient, you can do early oral refeeding and early discharge and reduce lengths of stay by three to five days. High risk patients would undergo delayed refeeding and you can reduce readmissions from about 20% down to less than five. You can increase patient safety and turn those losses that you're getting on every surgery into profits for, for the hospital who are now struggling. So the, the way we demonstrate the value prop of this is we really compare the hospital to its peers based on 
uh, the case mix index, which is really just the difficulty of cases that it does and the number of annual discharges. And we put the average length of stay in quartiles. Now we can help a hospital reduce their length of stay and readmissions for any hospital in any quartile. But if you look at this extreme example here of a hospital in the fourth quartile, we could use it using privacy A and doing the appropriate thing could reduce uh, average length of stay by up to four days, lower readmissions by 43%, reduce patient risk. And we have a very extensive uh, budget impact model that was developed by a third party health economics firm demonstrating that in intestinal surgery alone, and this is just one small segment of major abdominal surgery, it would have a, a, a budget a positive budget impact for the hospital of almost $10 million. If you expand that out to all of major abdominal surgery, that would be almost up to 45 or $50 million in positive budget impact. So it's better for surgeons, it's better for patients, it's better for hospitals, and it's better for, for payers. Um, so what we really believe is going to drive this is ambulatory surgery. There's been a real surge of interest in ambulatory surgery with one day length of stay because of cost pressures that hospitals are, 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 are having right now. So everybody's looking to reduce length of stay. The inability to predict post-operative ileus has been what has uh, really hindered doing ambulatory surgery. Privacy A is, not, is right 95% of the time when it says there's a low-risk patient. So it becomes indispensable in the discharge decision uh, for the surgeon. Those patients were low-risk patients. You could discharge them within one day, and you could, um, you could reduce length of stay by three to seven days and have savings of over $10,000 uh, $10, per case in up to 30% of cases, which obviously would be uh, better for the hospital. And actually releasing a patient as soon as possible is better for the patient. They tend to recuperate better at home. Um, the post-operative ileus market worldwide, we believe, is about $6.5 billion in the U.S. Is, and the EU, which are two markets that we're really interested in initially, are about a billion and a half dollars each. Um, it's a single-use device. We have 20 people out, sales reps out in the field right now uh, covering about 23 states. They directly call on surgeons. They identify surgeon champions who present to value committees. The device, the average selling price is about $600. That provides about an eight to 10 times ROI for the hospital. And it's about an 80% gross margin product at scale. So our go-to-market strategy was to call directly on physicians in, the, in these places that you see on this map. And we'll be expanding that sales force from 20 to about 32 reps uh, between now and the end of um, 2024. We already have the expanded label and we're rolling out an ambulatory uh, collecting the quality improvement collaborative that we believe is really going to drive adoption of this. And we're also guaranteeing the device. We've not even rolled out the ambulatory collectomy uh, quality improvement collaborative yet. We've already got six sites who are interested in doing it. We think once we roll it out this quarter, it's going to be, it's going to really expand very quickly. We have six hospital systems representing about 48 hospitals that are already moving toward value analysis committee. And, we, and all eight of our clinical sites are interested in using the device as well. Uh, that has led us to Prevost AI, which is our next version of this, and it's a rapid development acoustic IoT wearables platform. We already have the second product off that developed Prevost AI gut. We've already received prototypes for it. We'll file a 510K probably in 2025. The reason we did this is because it's more accurate out of the box than Prevost CA is, and it's machine learning, so it's continuously improved performance as it gets more data, and it costs it's half the cost of a Prevost CA device. So the company benefits, boosts its margins dramatically, and the customer gets a better value prop. Also, we think the future of the company is in using uh, this technology in other areas, such as heart and lung, predicting a bronchospasm, telling that patient they're going to have one before they have one, an asthma patient, or decompensation in CHF. And we'll have some data on that in, later in this year, which will be a major milestone for us. Um, we have a well-rounded uh, management team, and experienced management team. I've been the CEO of three predictive analytics companies. John Cromwell is the heart and soul of what we do. He is a clinical professor of surgery and AI expert at the University of Iowa who developed both of these technologies. Andrew Forzik has been a CFO for over 20 years with um, various early stage companies. We have a very active board. Terry Wall and Sean Foydick both have numerous exits under their belt, and they've helped us craft this 1099 sales strategy that we have. We have a very experienced sales management team, both on the contract sales organization side and on the 1099 rep side. Uh, our capital needs right now, we, we're highly capital efficient. We got privacy to market with $3.75 billion in total corporate expenditures. The current uh, convertible note that we're doing captures some rapidly developing milestones, including privacy EA 
revenue generation. As I said, that note, we've already got 1.675 committed on that note, and we're taking it to 1.75, and we'll close uh, on October the 31st. We've got several upcoming um, uh, milestones this year, which will be uh, contract uh, hospital contracts for private CA, uh, proof of concept in AI heart and lung, and then rolling out the ambulatory collectomy that we believe is really going to drive private CA towards the standard of care, and several in 2024 uh, 20, uh, and 2025, which would include expanding re private CA revenue, the ambulatory collectomy collaborative, and then moving into 25, filing a 510K and a CE mark for Previs AI gut the next generation product. So we've got a product coming up, near-term revenue, the second product on the shelf, and a, and, a, <clears throat> and moving into another sp much larger space than we're in now in heart and lung going forward. And we believe that we'll be generating revenue in the next three to six months with regard to that. And that is our story. Uh, Hall, what are your questions? Oh, thanks, buddy, for that. Uh, if you want to turn on your video, you're welcome to do so. Uh, oh, Dr. So Castro, what, what is your uh, first question? And then I have several myself. Sorry. Um, overall, great great device. I, I, I may have missed it. Are there any other competitors that are doing something similar? No, there's nobody else on, uh, on the market or that we know of that's uh, in the queue for <clears throat> for doing what we do. We're the only device or what or, or method to uh, actually assess a patient's risk for developing gastrointestinal impairment for postoperative ileus or other causes. Thank you. My question is about physician uh, change. Uh, what what must a physician do to change their process, procedure, or training in order to do this, if any? They don't, they don't have to do anything. Actually, they, they don't really even deal with the device. It would be a, a nurse in the OR or in the PACU who would uh, just apply the device to the patient, and then you push one button and it activates. It's a self-attending device, so you don't have anything else to do. What would happen is it's like just like a physician writes medication orders right after surgery, the same thing would happen here. It would basically say, if the device says, you know, that the patient is at low risk, then go ahead and feed them per my, you know, the normal protocol. If the device says the patient is at high risk, with whole feeding and contact me, and I will let you know what to do with that patient. We will not be feeding them right out, out of the bat, uh, out of the box. So it's just regular post-operative uh, orders that they would be giving for medications and other reasons anyway. So it doesn't really change what they have to do. And, and how long before you achieve FDA approval? Uh, it's already approved. The device is approved and cleared. We we launched the device into the market uh, in the first quarter. We already have uh, six hospitals, uh, six hospital systems moving toward value analysis committee, uh, which we believe could uh, all those could occur by the end of the year. So and we and we're building on that pipeline every single day because we have about 20 sales reps in the field calling on about 500 hospitals uh, moving those forward. And how much is left in the round at this point? Uh, about seventy-five thousand dollars. We we announced uh, that we had gotten a major investment from our contract sales organization last Thursday. You no, know, I've already received almost a couple hundred thousand dollars since then, and so we've got about seventy-five thousand dollars left, and that will close out on October the thirty-first. Great. And you use AI in this system, and it looked like a large language model, but can you tell us a little bit more about how you built that and uh, what exactly is it doing as a part of the process here? Yeah, initially it was using machine learning to sort of figure out which of the uh, acoustic biomarkers, because there were lots of acoustic biomarkers that were developed to do this. And then and then once we those were narrowed down, those different acoustic biomarkers, um, it was used to choose one of those markers, and then we moved it into a clinical trial. Now, that's feature engineering with, with Previs, Previs EA. With Previs AI, it is a whole different animal. It takes basically a fingerprint of hundreds of different um, acoustic biomarkers to improve the accuracy of, of, of you know, the prediction that we're actually doing. So, and then it can learn, you know, it's machine learning, so it learns over time uh, as you present it with more and more data with doing that. And that's what led us also into being able to do things in heart and lung, being able to make that fingerprint of different audio signatures of patients who were about to develop, uh, you know, some condition, but have not developed it yet so that you could intervene and prevent it from happening. Are you planning to increase AI into other areas? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now, you know, we sort of have our hands full in the GI area and then the heart and the lung area. So those are, I mean, the heart and the lung area is a massive area of patients with with you know CHF and asthma and COPD, 
Um, right. And, you know, the, the near term revenue for the company is going to come from the GI segment and predicting gastrointestinal impairment. So, so Paul, I'm not sure that we could expand our bandwidth enough to do anything else, but those are the three major systems in the body that actually produce a lot of audio that can be used for doing, you know, predictive type things for, for adverse events. And what was your biggest challenge in implementing AI in this application? Uh, you know, it turned out to be ambient noise, how you handle ambient, you know, just noise in the room, the, the extraneous noise that doesn't mean anything. And what do you do with that? And that's one of the things that Previs AI helps us to do, because we have some very elegant algorithms that sit in the cloud where all the processing is done that can actually separate signal to, from noise to increase our signal to noise ratio to get us a, you know, the more pure the signal is, the better that, you know, the better you're going to be able to predict. And we, we really can't do that on the device because it takes uh, on a, a device like privacy a we have other ways of doing it there um, that are not quite as eloquent as it but that improves signal to noise the ratio and helps us do that but that turned out to be the biggest technical challenge and took quite some time to to resolve thank god we've already done that hey great well it looks like a great implementation and a great product as well uh, thank you uh, for sharing that with us today. Uh, with that, uh, go ahead and close it out. If there are no more questions, want to thank uh, everybody for coming today. Great questions from you guys. And uh, Dr. Harvey, uh, thank you so much for your presentation as well on the update with AI and chat GPT and healthcare. It looks like things are progressing well, but challenges still rely, uh, you know, remain ahead. Did you have any final thoughts there you want to share with us? No, I think like everything, uh, use it like you're riding a bike. The more you do it, the more you learn. Um, it's not going away. Literally today or recently, the SEC said this is this is something that they're worried that may crash the market. And if they're that worried <laughs> that this is changing uh, different verticals, then I think all of us need to really understand this technology. Great. We well, appreciate that. Looking forward to having you back again soon for another update. I want to thank uh, Buddy Lyons for the presentation on NTAC and Cecilia Vieni for their presentation on high prevention. Uh, with that, we're going to close it out for today and looking forward to having you guys uh, back soon and have a good one. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.